The one question every math student ends up asking at some point is, what is this useful for? When can I use it? Where do you see this stuff in the real world? Well, if you're watching this video, you need to be comfortable and familiar with counting principles. How to deal with grouped items, how to deal with items where there are repetitions, and how to deal with selections when you're making arrangements. Well, today we are going to take those counting principles and we're going to apply them to one of the most useful things in the world, probabilities. Now, before we get to applying counting principles, we first have to remember how to calculate probabilities. And we remember that the probability of an event A is defined as the number of ways in which A can happen divided by the total number of possible outcomes, which we can also call the size of the sample space. Right, and we can find both of these using counting rules given that we've got an appropriate question to apply it to. So let's have a look. Example one, the letters of the word century is rearranged. So there's century, it's a six letter word, right? And all of those letters are unique. There's no duplicates. So what is the probability that an arrangement starts with S? What is the probability that N and T are next to each other? And what is the probability that an arrangement starts with T or starts with Y? Let's have a look at the first question. So in order to calculate a probability, the first thing we need to do is to find the size of the sample space. Now in this instance, the size of the sample space or the total number of possible outcomes is all the ways in which we can rearrange century. Right, and because there's six letters and they're all unique, that's just six factorial. So there are six factorial total arrangements of century that are possible. And now we can look at our event A, which is the probability that an arrangement starts with S. So now we've got to find out how many ways can an arrangement start with S. So we've got six letters, so we've got six places to put all of those letters when we make selections for our arrangement, but the first space is occupied. It has to be an S. So the first space, we can't put anything else there, and now we can't choose the S to put it anywhere else. So I've scratched it out over there. So now we've got five objects to choose from, and we've got five places to put it, right? And that simply becomes five factorial different ways in which you can arrange those five objects in the five remaining spaces. So the number of ways in which A can happen is five factorial. So the probability of A is going to be the N of A over the N of S is five factorial divided by six factorial is equal to one over six. So one out of every six possible arrangements of century will start with an S. Let's look at the second question there. What is the probability that N and T are next to each other? So N and T have to be next to each other. Now again, before we do anything else, we need to find the size of the sample space. And that again is six factorial because it's still just century and it's still just being arranged. Right, so now N and T have to be next to each other. So N and T are now a group. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is how many ways can N and T be arranged within that group? So there's two positions and two things to choose from. In the first position, we can choose either N or T. So there's two things to choose from, right? And in the next position, one thing's already been chosen. So there's one thing to choose from. So event X, the number of ways we can arrange N and T within that group is going to be two factorial. Right, now that N and T are a group, we have to find out how many ways can we arrange century with N and T being together as a group. So now N and T as a group is considered as one object within that arrangement of century. So we actually have five objects that we need to rearrange. And we know that five objects 
can be arranged in five factorial different ways. So arranging those we're going to call event y. And then when we apply the fundamental counting principle, we find that the number of ways in which this event A can happen has to be the number of ways X can happen, rearranging N and T together within the group, and the multiplied by the number of ways Y can happen, which is rearranging everything but keeping N and T together as one object within that arrangement. And that's 2 factorial times 5 factorial, and that is going to be useful when we try and calculate the probability. So that becomes 2 factorial times 5 factorial divided by 6 factorial. And if you plug that into your calculator, you'll get 1 over 3. So a way to interpret that is to know that 1 out of every 3 arrangements of century is going to have n and t next to each other. Then we can move on to c. What is the probability that an arrangement starts with t or starts with y? Well, again, we've got to know our sample size, and that's 6 factorial. So, the first position, right, we have only two options. It either has to start with t or it has to start with y. So, there are two ways in which we can choose the first letter of our arrangement, either t or either y. And then there are five positions left, and because we've chosen something to put in the first place, there are now five things to choose from for those five positions. So event y, choosing the rest of them, is going to be able to be done in five factorial different ways. So then again, Applying the fundamental counting principle, we've got to multiply the number of ways we can choose the first letter, multiplied by the number of ways we can choose the rest of them, event X and event Y, and we're going to get 2 times 5 factorial as the total number of arrangements there. So then to find the probability, we've got to take the number of ways we can do A divided by the sample space, and we get 2 times 5 factorial divided by 6 factorial, and your calculator will give you 1 out of 3. So 1 out of every 3 arrangements of century starts with either a T or a Y. If you select a random arrangement from all the arrangements, there's a 1 out of 3 chance that you will end up with a selection that starts with a T or a Y. Now we move on to example 2. The letters of the word seesaw is rearranged. And some questions is, what is the probability that an arrangement starts with A and ends with W? So then again, we've got to find the number of ways in which this can be done in total, the sample space, right? So seesaw, we see there that we've got six letters, right? But we've got S that is repeated twice and E that is repeated twice. So we apply our counting principle that uh, deals with repetitions, right? And we now know that we have to have 6 factorial at the top for the 6 things that are arranged, divided by 2 factorial for the 2 S's that are repeated, times 2 factorial for the 2 E's that are repeated. And we find that there are 180 unique arrangements of seesaw where one S and the other S are seen as being exactly the same thing. Right, so now we've got to find out how we can arrange this so that it starts with an A and ends with a W, right? So it starts with an A, so we don't have an A to choose from anymore, so we can scratch that out, and it ends with a W. So we don't have a W to choose from anymore, right? That has to go at the end. So now we can just choose how to arrange the four things in the middle, right? So there are four things in the middle that need to be arranged and the S is repeated twice and the E is repeated twice. So the number of ways we can rearrange the S, E, E, S that goes in the middle between the A that can't move and the W that can't move is going to be 4 factorial, because there's four things, divided by 2 factorial for the repeated S's times 2 factorial for the repeated E's and that is going to be equal to 6. The probability there is going to be equal to 6 divided by 180. 
Let's have a look at example three. A five digit code is created from numbers only. Numbers may not be repeated in the code. So as always, we have some questions. What is the probability that the code ends in a two, four or six? Or what is the probability that the code does not end in a two, four or six? Let's have a look. So for question one there, we start at the very beginning, which is a good place to start. And we are going to find the size of the sample space, right? So we've got a five digit code, right? That's made from numbers only, right? So numbers, there are, as far as I know, 10 of them that we use, right? And because we've got 10 and we're selecting five from them, that sounds like a selection. And we've got to use the counting principle that relates to selections. And you can see that rule on your screen over there, right? So just to remind you, we do have 10 numbers, not nine because zero is included, even though the biggest one is nine, right? So we've got 10 things that we can choose from and we're choosing five from them. So 10 factorial because there are 10 numbers that we're choosing from and five there is because we're making a five digit code. So we're making five selections and five then is the value of R. So we get that there are 30,240 different ways in which we can make this code. Right, so that's the size of the sample space, the total number of outcomes, right? So now we've got to see how many ways can we make this code where it ends in a two, four or six. So let's call event X choosing that final digit, right? And we've got three different ways in which that can happen because we can either choose a two, a four or a six. So event X choosing the final digit, right? Can happen in three different ways. And then we've got four digits remaining where we need to select the rest of the code, right? So event Y will be selecting the rest of the code, right? And in the first position, there are nine things to choose from because one of our digits has been chosen and now belongs there at the end with event X. And then there's eight, seven and six to choose from for the remaining ones. So using that, we can then find the number of ways in which this event A can happen, right? And you'll notice there that I've chosen to use the same rule that we use for selections for event Y because I've got nine things to choose from for event Y and I've got four places that I need to put those. So my number of selections is four. So I've used that formula with nine factorial at the top and the value of R being four in order to calculate the number of ways I can do event Y and then multiplying them together, you get 9072. So then the probability is going to be the number of ways you can do A divided by the sample space is 9072 divided by 30,240 is equal to three over 10. So if you randomly select one of the digit, well, one of the codes from all of the codes that you can possibly make, three out of them are gonna end in a two, four or six, right? Let us move on to B here. What is the probability that the code does not end in a two, four or six? Well, let's just think about question A again. What is the probability that the code does end in a two, four or six? Yes, you're thinking it. These are complementary events, right? The one event and the other event are complete opposites of each other and the two added together will give you the size of the sample space because all of the codes either end in two, four or six or do not end in two, four or six. So not ending in two, four or six, we're going to call A and ending in a two, four or six, we're going to call A prime, which we know means A's complement. Right? And we know that the probability of A plus the probability of A's complement must be equal to one. So P of A is equal to one minus P of not A or A's complement, right? And the probability of A's complement, we actually figured out in the previous question. So lucky for us, we can just go one minus three over 10 is equal to seven over 10. So do you see 
if you identify that you have complementary events, especially in sequential questions, then you can save yourself so much working out by finding the probability of the complement and then go one minus the probability of that. That frequently happens when it's so much easier to find the probability of the complement than it is for the original event. So keep that technique in mind. So let's summarize what we've done today. Again, the probability of an event is the number of ways in which it can happen divided by the total number of possible outcomes. And we first use the counting rules to find the size of our sample space. And then we interpret the restrictions, the things that they say in the question must end in this, must start in that, that or that must be together. And we find the number of ways that can happen using our counting rules. And then we just go top divided by bottom. There you have counting principles applied to things such as groups, repetitions and selections. So how about you apply yourself, maybe form a study group, do a few repetitions of some practice examples and you could be part of a selection that makes your principle proud. And only you control the probability of that.